Hello everyone, a very good evening to you and a warm welcome from me. My name is Richard Blanco and I am the chair of the Redbridge Landlords Forum and also the London representative for the National Residential Landlords Association. Um, we've got a packed meeting this evening, it's fantastic to have you all here um, and it's really great that um, we're able to continue these meetings online, of course. So I hope you'll, you'll appreciate that. And my thanks to Misha uh, Kula, who has organised the meeting and to all of her colleagues as well for making it possible. Just a few bits of housekeeping before we get going. I just wanted to make you aware that the meeting is being recorded um, and so uh, it will be available to see again afterwards if you need to. You are all actually muted, um, but you can ask questions. So please do feel, do feel free to ask questions. They will be monitored by my colleagues and um, they will be put into the uh, public domain so that we can ask them during the course of the meeting. Uh, we may group some of the questions into themes or, you know, if there are too many for us to do all at once, but we'll try and get through as many as we possibly can. There will also be an opportunity at the end of the meeting for you to give us some feedback. Um, so uh, that will get emailed to you. We'd love to have that from you. Um, we're going to try our best to make things run as smoothly as possible. But as you know, with um, the way these webinars tend to go, there can be technical hitches now and again. So do bear with us if things get tricky um, uh, at all during the meeting. Um, before um, I uh, get stuck into the meeting, I want to welcome our first speaker, who is Councillor Jazz. Hathwell, who's going to just say a few words for us um, this evening, and he is the leader of Redbridge Council. Um, are you there, councillor? Just checking you're with us. Yes, I am, sir. Fantastic. Good evening. A very warm welcome from my living room to what looks like maybe your living room. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, uh, th thank you very much. Um, can I welcome everybody to our first virtual landlord forum? And thank you for thank you for taking the time really to join us tonight. Um, but firstly, can I just um, send some apologies, Councillor Hussain, who stepped down as the cabinet member um, for housing and homelessness in order to spend some more time with a family, particularly following a bereavement. And I know she's also undertaking uh, further studies, doing a PhD. And I wish her all the best. And um, so I'm afraid you're lumbered with me. Um, let me start. We're, we're very lucky in Redbridge to be the home to so many responsible landlords. And, um, and I generally mean that because one of the things people have always accused me of is, you know, you brought this in, it's this and that. Believe me, I'm a landlord myself and it's cost me as much. But certainly I'm with you. And certain, you know, I want to improve standards. And um, it's clear that vast majority of our local landlords are very good, provide an excellent standard of private rented accommodation. Of that, there is no doubt. However, there is a very small minority who do flout the rules, end up facing enforcement action, and that's never good. And we do want to raise the quality of standard for our tenants. Landlords are really, really important. In, in our communities. You provide the essential service, basically making sure there is good quality housing available for local families, local children. And what I really want to say is that you are appreciated. Um, COVID-19 has been a challenge for us all, but as landlords, there are particular and direct changes to the business practices that we need to sort of look into. The eviction ban has changed the way many landlords are having to work. Similarly, the risk of the virus has meant landlords have to change the way they manage their properties. And later tonight, you'll hear advice from public health on how to protect tenants, how to protect yourself. The fact is, landlords are facing increasing levels of reg regulation. And to find out more about these regulations, please go to the government website for up to date information. Sometimes it changes daily you know, on understanding your rights, responsibilities as a landlord. And our council wants landlords to work with us and help us eradicate criminal activity operating from rented properties. You know, for instance, brothels. You will hear about this later in the meeting as well from community safety colleagues. We want to work with landlords to drive up standards in all types of rented accommodation. 
and address other issues that can arise, such as noise, untidy front gardens and antisocial behaviour. Our enforcement and property licensing teams will work with you. So if you need help or advice, please don't hesitate uh, to get in touch with them. And the email, certainly PRS licensing at redbridge.gov.uk. And of course, uh, we've got housing.standards at redbridge.gov.uk. And I'm sure these, e these emails will be made available to you throughout the evening. And through working cooperatively with each other, we can ensure local people get the best possible choices of accommodation and your businesses remain protected for the future. Our ultimate goal is a better borough that benefits us all. So thank you. Thank you to all of you, all the landlords and officers here tonight, you know, for taking your valuable time out and doing the ongoing contribution to improving the private rented sector in Redbridge. And certainly as leader of the council, I thank you from the bottom of my heart, really raising standards for our residents. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Athwell. And it's great to hear that um, the hard work that many landlords in the borough are doing is appreciated. And um, we look for, forward to working with you positively uh, into the future. And it'd be great to have you perhaps in a future forum, perhaps in, in some sort of question and answer um, session where we can talk to you about some of our issues. I'd love to come along and um, certainly uh, do that. It'd be, you know, I look forward to it. Fantastic. Thank you very Just much have indeed. To invite me. Most people don't invite me, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm very pleased to have you here tonight. Thank you very much indeed for Thank coming. You. Thanks. OK, take care. Thank you very much. Um, OK, well, we'll move on um, uh, now because I want to, uh, wonders of technology, I'm going to share my screen now and um, just go through, uh, there we go, yep, yeah, uh, what's happening this evening. Um, so we'll just quickly run through the agenda here and this should hopefully come up. I always get that error message, I'm afraid, but there we go. Here we go. Here's our agenda for this evening. So um, we're just going to have a look at the minutes of the last meeting in a moment. And then there's the issue of the election of the chair. And uh, I'll explain that shortly when we get to it. Um, we've got Paul Campbell, who's Managing Director of Green Vision Energy Limited, who's going to be talking about Green Homes Grants. He's an external speaker who's joining us this evening. Gladys uh, Xavier is uh, joining us from uh, Public Health and Commissioning, and she's going to be talking about protecting your tenants. Um, Martin Pereira is the Senior Accommodation Manager who is going to be talking about housing needs and giving us an update on that. We've got um, a short presentation on waste collection in Redbridge from Lackey Begum, who is from the um, who is the Neighbourhood Education and, and Engagement Officer. And um, eighth on our agenda is from licensing and enforcement, where we're getting an update. Um, uh, where we're getting. All right. Is that, I'm hoping that you can see this OK. I seem to have a message suggesting that you can't, but um, I shall carry on and hope that you can. If not, I'll just continue reading it. Um, so we're having a licensing and enforcement update from Ed Chaplin, who is interim head of consumer protection and licensing, and he'll be joined by Cheryl Hart and Sh uh, Shamol Ali as well. Um, and then I shall be doing a presentation on the top 10 challenges facing London landlords or what I think are the top 10 challenges. Um, and our last presentation will be from Sam Brough, who is a community safety officer who will be talking about um, brothels and uh, his uh, messages don't fall victim to a brothel. And he'll be talking about spotting the signs before the fines. So that's our agenda for this evening. Um, what we're also going to be looking at as well before we move on are the minutes. Just bring the minutes up for you. There we go. Now, what I suggest with the minutes is if you've got any issues with the minutes, then do contact us 
um, by the end of the meeting um, through the questions uh, portal. Uh, and uh, if there's an issue on there, something that you would like to be changed, then let us know. What I'll do as well is say that we'll wait until the end of tomorrow as well. So you can email PRS licensing if there's an issue with the minutes at all that you'd like to bring up before we confirm them as being um, a correct version of uh, the last meeting, which was some time ago. I mean, those days when we could all actually meet in a room. Um, right, I think somebody's saying that you can't see that screen. So I'm sorry, I think what we'll have to do is email that out with the feedback form so that you can get a chance to see that. So it's a PDF and for some reason it's not showing correctly. Um, OK, so I will unshare my screen now and hopefully you can see me again now. Um, what we will do now is uh, move on to the next item, which is the election of the chair. And I want to explain how this is going to happen. Now, because of the constitution, we do need to elect the chair at regular intervals. Um, there was a period that we had open for a cons considerable period of time to see if there are any other nominations. And we haven't received any other nominations uh, other than myself. Um, so uh, we are going to have an election, though, to check that there are a substan substantial number of people that do want me to continue as chair. So there's going to be a poll link that will be published in the chat for you to see. And what I'd like you to do is to click on that, uh, that will take you through to um, uh, a piece of software called Straw Poll. So it's a Straw Poll survey. That's the software. And you'll be given the chance to say yes or no, whether you want me to continue as chair. And so obviously, if there's a majority that say yes, then I will continue. If the majority says no, then we'll need to um, sort out some other solution and try and get somebody else to chair. I'm very happy to continue chairing um, uh, for another year. I think the term is possibly for two years, actually. Um, so I'm happy to continue if you're happy for me to continue as chair then I'm, I'm happy to go forward. But equally, if, if you would like somebody else to chair and you're not happy for me to continue, then you are at liberty to vote no. So that uh, election is going to be open for 30 minutes. So if you would just go in there and just click on that uh, within the next 30 minutes and we will have an announcement before the end of the webinar uh, to let you know the result. OK, well, next we're going to move on to our first speaker who was having technical problems. I'm hoping that he's with us. Um, this is uh, Paul Campbell, who is Managing Director of Green Vision Energy Limited, who's going to tell us about Green Homes grants. Now, is Paul with us? Let's just leave a silence there and see if he appears. Hello, Paul, are you there? OK, I suspect he's not with us. No, he's not with us. OK, I've just had a message through. So uh, not to worry, we'll move on to our next speaker and hopefully we'll get Paul with us shortly. So our next speaker is uh, Gladys Xavier, uh, who is going to talk to us about protecting your tenants. She's a uh, London Borough of Redbridge Director of Public Health and Commissioning. So I'm hoping you're with us, Gladys. Are you there? Yes. Yeah, I am. Hooray, lovely Hi. to see you. Welcome, Gladys. Thank you, Richard, and thank I you so much. I over to you. Thank you. Uh, I'd actually like to change the title of my talk. It's not just about protecting your tenants, it's also about protecting yourselves. Because when you visit tenants' home, you've got every right to expect to be protected. It's about protecting each other. So I just want to put it into context. We are in the middle of the pandemic, so COVID-19. So we it started all in March, April time, if you remember, it's, we, it really peaked. We had very high numbers. We also had lots of hospital admissions. We uh, we lost most of us, I think, would know anyone, some people who have lost their loved ones. And we are a diverse borough. And we also heard that it really is a higher risk if you're from a black or Asian or ethnic background. So we know all that. So it is a new virus. We, we learn as we go along. So we are now sort of into October time. So it is, I mean, you would have seen in the news what it is like in northeast, northwest. There are larger numbers, so it's described by per 100,000, so they have got about 400 per 100,000, so they have got some extra restriction apart from the national uh, restrictions. So we are not into that uh, national lockdown phase. So at the moment, we are, it's a watch and wait. So London, so if I bring it to London and national, London and Redbridge. Nationally, you would know that we are seeing more cases. 
So this is a nasty virus. It is highly transmissible. So that means it does pass, it passes around a lot. So we've seen that in families, universities, workplaces, in all types of area. We are all equally susceptible. No one has got immunity against this virus. So we must take it very seriously. So the other thing, we are also testing more people. So the more we test, the more cases we find. So the purpose of finding cases, then you identify the contacts, you self-isolate, and then you break the chain of infection. So we are seeing more cases. I, I'm sure you would have seen in the news, there's been some glitch about, uh, they're blaming the IT system, but we're not really sure how it happened. There have been more cases than what we thought. So I think it's gone up to about 13,000 cases per day. I think it was yesterday. For me personally, I think we should we, we should worry about the numbers, but we also mustn't forget the number of admissions going into hospitals and people who are dying. So today we have heard, I have always said, watch out for those because we have heard more people are getting admitted and also the death, uh, they are going up. Not as much as it was earlier on because uh, we had a daily increase, but this is sort of every two to three weeks. But nevertheless, <clears throat> it is increasing. So then if I bring it to Redbridge for, for London, you must have seen in the news, we have got one of the highest numbers of cases in the borough. So we are still the same, I think at the moment, it's about 90 per 100,000. So we are quite concerned. Uh, again, we are very fortunate. I think we're one of the very first boroughs, I think. Um, we, we managed to get a local uh, test center, local testing center in, uh, in the car park in um, Mileway. But we've also been fortunate to get a second one in Gans Hill. So that went operational uh, earlier this week as well. So we're also uh, looking for a third site. So we want our residents to have access to testing across the borough, not just uh, not just go to one area. So we've been very, very fortunate. So one of the reasons when we are, when I asked the London Regional Director of Public Health, why are we seeing such an increase in Redbridge compared to other parking and diagram is similar, other boroughs, what he said was, look, compared to other boroughs, you're testing more because you, you, you know, you, you have managed to get more testing. So that's one reason. And also, secondly, the other boroughs in London are not far behind you. So I think, so we, if, if you remember, four weeks ago, our numbers went up and we started taking lots and lots of prevention. Uh, so we looked at the data. I mean, I get data daily on who, how many cases. I also get uh, data on postcodes, uh, people's names, contacts. So we look at this. So my job first thing in the morning is to look whereabouts are we seeing, how are getting people getting infected, what what is it that we are not doing well or we are doing well. So we've been doing lots of. I know uh, the leader is on on the call. So with the help of the leader, uh, our sort of chair of the health and wellbeing board, and lots of other officers, we have been collectively working together to see what what else we can do. So we have started doing a lot of engagement activities. So like this webinar today, we have been engaging with local councillors, uh, faith leaders, community leaders, officers, other organisations, businesses, really to come together to see how we protect each other. So most, so if you're going to sort of, as this is a landlord's forum, from your perspective, if you visit a home and if someone says to you, or if you ring them and they're saying they've been told to self-isolate, either they have uh, tested positive or they've been a contact of someone with COVID, then you really wouldn't want to go and visit. So even if you do visit a home, because the way I would say it, you treat anyone you don't know as though they have got COVID. So you take those precautions. So hand washing is the important bit as well. And the two meter distance. The reason why we keep saying two meter distance is that is about six feet. This virus it's a fairly heavy virus, so if you're speaking and sneezing, or you, the droplets, they they fall on the ground. So, so that two meter distance is a good one. But if you can't safe distance, then if it's then you do wear a say a face covering. So that that's for shops or even in if you as a landlord you visit homes, and some some homes may be very small. Make sure you do. And when I, I was talking to uh, one of the landlords earlier and I was talking about hand washing. He said, I wouldn't wash in uh, some people's houses because 
I don't really know because it's not very hygienic. I always say uh, carry a small um, uh, sanitizer in your hair, in your pocket. And then I always say sanitizers are good, but nothing beats hand washing. So really it's also, again, when tenants, when you go to tenants, if they're standing close to you, you're quite all right to say to them, could I say, could you safe distance, please? I often say that to people in shops or elsewhere, because I think generally as human beings, we want to be close to each other. We want to give a hug, but it's really, really difficult for all of us. But we must keep those messages. And one of the things I know we are trying very hard in Redbridge is if you if your tenants are self isolating, some people think if you're self isolating, your families can visit you or you can go out. But you, we really do not want people to go out. The whole purpose of self isolating is that for 14 days, the virus itself, then it, you become less infectious. So even if you're suspected, we tell you because you can pass on the virus if you're uh, if you're asymptomatic, what we call the incubation period. So really, I think I would say anywhere if you have got close contact, take all the precautions. And if you're and then, and then I, I would always say if you have symptoms, self isolate and then get a test. You can book it online. We are trying our best to have some walk in slots. We used to have that and because of national guidance that was uh, pulled out from all of us. But we are trying very hard whether we can bring that back. But that's at the moment, it's only for people with symptoms. So the symptoms are high temperature. So the onset is very, very sudden. So a cough, suddenly a cough comes and you can't really stop it. Uh, and also sometimes also loss of smell and taste. So it's not like a cold or because we are coming to a flu season and people will get colds and there are other viruses as well. But they generally make you feel a bit sore throaty and you know what it feels like. But if you get these symptoms, you know that you have got COVID. If you suspect you've got COVID, self-isolate. That is for your tenants or yourselves as well. And then get a test. Don't sort of, when you have symptoms, go out to get a test. Always self-isolate first. So I'm going to stop there. I understand I've only got five minutes. And any questions on the chat, or I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Gladys. Um, we haven't had any questions yet, so but do stay around, won't you? Because we may have questions later on. Thanks very much for that update. That that's great, and of course we're all trying our best, aren't we, to to operate as professionally as we can in the current circumstances. Um, so, sorry, sorry, Richard. Just one thing I just want, which I forgot to say. I think I want people to remember we are. This virus is going to be with us for at least another six months. So we need to find a way of living, working in a safe environment. We are expecting a, a vaccine, but that won't be available if we're lucky till the end of the year. And when it does come out, it will be prioritized. The priority would be people over the age of 80 and then working down. So I think if we, if we take that, the mindset, it's going to be with us for the next six months and we've got to find a way of working, living, and in general, within the current guidance and rules, that'll be easier to manage. Thank you. OK, well, thank you very much, Gladys. Um, and uh, we may get to speak to you later, but I'm going to move on now to our next speaker. We're jumping around the agenda a little bit, um, but we're going to hear from Lucky Begum next, who uh, is uh, the London Borough of Redbridge Neighbourhood Education and Engagement Officer. Hello, Lucky. Um, you're going to talk to us about waste collection in Redbridge. Good evening, Richard. Can you see my slide? Yes, I can. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, everybody. My name is Lucky Begum and I am an Education and Engagement Officer for the Neighbourhood Street Scene Team. Now, the Neighbourhood Street Scene Team consists of the Street Cleansing Team, Environmental Enforcement, Education and Engagement and Greening Services, or better known as the Tree Officers. Um, as you know, Redbridge is a rich and diverse borough and in, in respect of this we have a designated neighbourhood team for each ward. So the neighbourhood teams consists of a neighbourhood manager, a street cleansing team leader, a senior enforcement officer and an education and engagement officer. This is so that we can tailor the services 
that we provide to the area that we're working with. <coughs> now, moving on to your duties as a landlord. As a landlord, you are a key partner in helping us to keep Redbridge clean, green and safe. Now, what do you need to do? What, are, what do we require from you? So these are quite simple um, requirements. First and foremost, that as a landlord, you provide adequate refuse storage facilities for waste and recycling for your tenants. Now, this can be a wheelie bin or any bin with a secure lid. It's as simple as that. We would like that you confirm collection day to your tenants and ensure that they present correctly and on the day of collection. We would like that you ensure bulky waste is disposed of correctly. Fly tipping is a major problem in the borough. Waste that isn't presented correctly will lead to enforcement ag action against you and your tenants. And last and not least, ensure that front gardens in your properties are kept tidy. Now, there's two things you can really help us with. Firstly, is the weekly waste collection or the rubbish collection, whatever you want to call it. Um, so we ask that your tenants um, place their waste bin on the boundary of their property by 6 a.m. on the day of collection. Now, we, we, if you look at the pictures, we don't ask that they remove the bags. There's no re reason to remove bags from the bin or the wheelie bin. Our collection teams will do that. Also, make sure that they place the recycling bins out on the same day. You can order collection um, recycle boxes and recycle bags from our team, which I'll give you information later on. Um, you can check your collection day, um, time, etc., all on our Redbridge Council on the Our Streets web, web page. Now, going, moving on to bulky waste. Bulky waste makes a up a huge part of the fly tipping problem that we have in the borough and there really is no reason to. Um, bulky, as a council taxpayer, you can book bulky waste collections for free. Obviously, as a landlord, you, any bulky waste that you produce is seen as business, is classed as business waste and you must ensure that whoever disposes of it has a waste carrier's license. Now, bulky waste we refer to as any large household item. So that can be a mattress, fridge, sofa. You see a lot of it around the borough. I don't need to give you a big description about it. Um, now, what we ask is that you either collect them, arrange a bulky waste collection through the council website, or there's a telephone number, which I'll give to you at the end. But you can also recycle and reduce. So not all bulky waste needs to be thrown into a tip. It can be recycled. You can, if it's in good condition, you can donate it to the TCL Reuse Centre. You can donate it to the British Heart Foundation. These are two options. Reducing your waste is just as important as, you know, looking after your tenants and looking after the environment is just as important. Um, third, and third and finally, fly tipping is a crime. Um, and there's no reason for bulky waste to be fly tipped in the borough. Like I said, there is the bulky waste collection and there is the reuse um, service that you can donate to. Um, there's also the Chigwell Road Reuse and Recycle Centre that you or your tenants can take waste to. Again, they'd have to present their council tax statement just to prove that they are residents in the borough. Um, moving on to recycling, we really encourage our residents, all residents that is, whether they're tenants or householders, um, they can have recycled boxes or if they live in a flat above a shop, they can have the orange recycling bags. Um, and that's again just to reduce the amount of waste we produce in the first place. Um, now, as the Neighbourhood Education Engagement Team, we run lots of community projects that you and your tenants can get involved with. We have community gardening, litter picking, play streets, lots of information which can be found on the Our Street page. Um, just today we packed up bulbs for the big bulb giveaway that is due in a week or two's time. Um, now, any resident can apply for that. It doesn't matter if they're a tenant, if they, it doesn't matter if they own the property. Um, again, the litter picking, we just had the Great British September clean. Lots of residents got involved to litter pick, to have community clear ups, and it just encourages cohesion and understanding amongst the varied population of Redbridge. 
Um, so I've spoken very quickly about waste and bulky waste and recycling. If you would like printed waste and recycling leaflets, you are able to email us on the our neighbourhood at redbridge.gov.uk and that will go to our inbox and we'll respond to you accordingly. If you've got a specific question with regards to waste collection or recycling in your properties that you're renting out, again, we'll try and support you and make sure that we're working together to avoid the fly tipping and littering that we often see and we don't want to see. I live in the borough and you know I want a clean green red bridge just as much as everybody else. Um, that's it from me, thank you. Great, Lackey, thank you very much. And you know, I think it's so important that landlords work with their tenants to make sure that rubbish doesn't get abandoned at the front of the property. I hate seeing kind of mattresses stuck in front gardens that people think are just going to vanish into the ether and don't realise that they need to contact bulky waste. One of the things I always do is when my tenants move in, in the induction chat, I uh, advise them that there is a bulky waste service and how to use that because I think quite often tenants are, are perhaps, you know, fairly, they may be fairly new to London, they may be fairly new to the UK and they don't understand that these sorts of services uh, are available. So um, it's good for landlords, I think, to inform them of those sorts of services. OK, well, I understand that we can now hear from Paul Campbell, who is Managing Director of Green Vision Energy Limited. Now, Paul, I've been asked to remind you to unmute your mic. Are you there? Hello, Paul, can you hear me? I can see your slide, which is promising. Let's just see uh, what's going on. Right, Paul, I think you need to unmute your mic. That's what I've been asked to tell you. Are you there? No, I don't think you are. Right, and I'm not hearing anything otherwise. So, OK, well, not to worry. I think we should move on then. Um, so we'll hopefully come back to Paul at some point. Sorry about the technical difficulty there. Um, but let's move on to our next speaker. And we're going to hear now from Licensing and Enforcement and Ed Chaplin, who is the Interim Head of Consumer Protection and Licensing, is going to join us. So I'm hoping that you're there, Ed. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear Richard, I can hear everybody and I hope you can hear me. Fantastic, yes. And Welcome, hopefully you Ed. can also see me. I, yes, we can. You're coming onto our screens now. Fantastic. And there's your presentation. Excellent. OK, <clears throat> well, you, you got my name, Richard. Thank you. <clears throat> Just to remind everybody, Ed Chaplin. Um, I'm the, uh, the, the current head of um, licensing and consumer protection matters in Redbridge. If you have difficulty in remembering the name, um, it's not too far away from our subject matter. Just remember Charlie Chaplin. And if you, you think back, you think of a black silhouette of a man with a, a, a cane, a walking stick, um, uh, a black bowler hat and a puppy dog and uh, and he's homeless. So that's right on uh, right on topic for us, isn't it? Um, so Charlie Chaplin, I am um, and property licensing and enforcement. Uh, we are OK. I do many things, but this is one particular important area of our work. Um, listen with interest to the leader of the council, Jazz Atwell and, and uh, very, very pleased to hear him uh, and, his, and his positive, which I knew about in any case, his positive message in relation to what um, private sector landlords offer for the council. Uh, I suppose my presentation is about what the council now can offer for private sector landlords in by way of help and support in, in supporting and working with those landlords, uh, the vast majority, of, vast majority of whom we work with and, and are helpful, positive and make a great contribution to our borough. Um, but as Jazz also mentioned, we do have occasions where we have to deal with the unscrupulous amongst the, uh, the landlord community and there aren't that many of them, thankfully, um, but we do have to deal with them. And that's one of the reasons maybe why we have the licensing scheme and uh, our objective to raise standards within the whole sector. <clears throat> this slide is particularly about um, what our priorities are. Um, no great surprise and we've already heard from Gladys uh, and it's on everybody's minds at the moment. You can't you can't move without seeing a message about coronavirus. That is our priority currently. The health and welfare um, of our residents in the borough and particularly our vulnerable residents and tenants um, and those in shared accommodation. Um, houses in multiple occupation, 
obviously that's a difficult environment for the for the virus to be managed and controlled self-isolating in the multiple occupation residency where there are shared facilities is extremely difficult and we're here we will advise and we will help and support uh, in any way we can in relation to questions in relation to that uh, <clears throat> we are having gone through a, a six month period of dealing with the coronavirus uh, we're now back to almost a business as usual so we're here we're supporting our landlords we're out and about in the borough and um, taking precautions as Gladys advises uh, and we are visiting um, landlords and, and helping with the licensing applications and with the standards in their properties and, and questions that they may have. Uh, <clears throat> we're particularly interested at the moment, and I know the leader is really interested and concerned, um, as having our HMOs, our houses in multiple occupation, are being regarded as a priority. Um, they, they have a place in our borough, they're, they're houses in multiple occupation, they do, they do supply exactly what they, they say on the tin. Multiple um, residences uh, in one location, but they also bring with them sometimes the problems. The uh, residents can be, as you're aware, transient. They can be um, supportive. Um, they can be easy to deal with and help. They can be difficult to deal with. Um, the, the problem premises that we really deal with that are causing problems in the neighbourhood very often are HMOs and we get many calls from uh, neighbours asking what the council can do to support them and to improve the standards in the property and the and the attitudes of, of the tenants towards them and social behaviour and their neighbours. We do selective licensing as you're all aware so uh, individual um, properties um, within about 80 percent of the borough we, we're doing a review at the moment and we're reporting to Councillor Atwell and his cabinet in the new year letting the cabinet know what we've managed to achieve with regards to the, the licensing scheme we have in the borough, how it's received, um, how we've worked with landlords and how landlords have worked with us uh, and how we've managed to raise standards. So that report will go to cabinet in the new year, It'll be a public meeting, so welcome to come along and hear what's said. Um, and whether cabinet thinks it's a good idea, which we believe at the moment we will be saying to them, that it's that we renew the licensing scheme for the, uh, the five years to come. Uh, and that's in about two years time. Recent recent um, issues in relation to landlords uh, to make you aware of um, there, there's new legislation from government. As Richard said, we're always having additional legislation um, thrust upon us and yourselves. We have to deal with it and we have to advise you uh, as landlords and uh, and support and work with you to get some compliance with these. EPC ratings you'll be familiar with. They run from A to F. Um, it's now a legal requirement if you are a landlord. Um, it's now a legal requirement in a, a, the private rented sector if you're a landlord to have your property um, above the standard of E to F. So if you're within those ratings, you're required to take action in order to lift the uh, the rating, save the environment, save the planet, um, a good objective, worthy objective, unless of course you fall into one of the uh, exemptions. And there are some exemptions if you've got a particularly old property, for instance, that may, may qualify. Um, and once you've spent a certain amount and you've done the best you can, uh, you cannot be required to go any further than that. And there are some new electrical regulations. I won't go into the detail of those, but they're just to improve electrical safety in all of our properties. Um, and you can see information on those in the uh, landlord's own pages. There's the uh, there's the link. <coughs> we're now developing as well. Um, we, we're, we're waiting to hear, are we not? Um, if Richard can get his presentation on um, on the green home scheme, green home grant scheme. We're looking to become a delivery partner in relation to that. We're certainly championing it and it is linked to our objective, obviously, um, to improve the EPC ratings on all of our properties in the borough. Just a quick snapshot on um, how we do, what we do and how we do it. These are visits by our officers. We have about a dozen, 15 officers who go out um, doing inspection visits to all of our properties. They are intelligence led, they are led on the basis of priority. Uh, <clears throat> um, where there are type one hazards, obviously they will um, they will receive a visit priority. Houses in multiple occupation, we need to check to ensure that the housing standards, the fire standards in those are uh, are up to scratch. So those are our sort of priorities for our visits. You see the dip there in April and May, uh, entirely COVID related, I have to say. But now you see 
August and September, we're starting to increase our business as usual again. Uh, so you'll see more of us in your properties working with you. Um, the dip in September, I can say, is because we're now doing more complex work. We are prioritising those houses in multiple occupation uh, where we've had applications that have come in in the intervening period for the, uh, for the COVID issues. OK, so that's our visits profile. Uh, <clears throat> just a note on formal actions. Please look at these slides later. They will be shared. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go into the great deal of detail here. They don't tell you very much is, is, is a chart like that. But when you start to analyse the figures, they do give you a, a picture of, of uh, what we're trying to achieve and what, and what we do. In, in the bottom right is the number. Our team has delivered 545 formal enforcement actions of one form or another. Top left, you see we've had, we're talking about problem premises. We apply to the, the magistrates for a warrant to enter those premises and then check with them, uh, check the standards. And as you see, there have been a significant number, 146 of those 545 actions have been where we've gained entry to our property to check the standards uh, and to, to deal with any issues there. Um, subsequently, we're quite happy to support landlords. We're not straight into an enforcement activity, uh, but believe you me, uh, we wouldn't be applying for a notice of entry until such time as we're, we've actually hit a bit of a brick wall in dealing with the landlord concerned. <clears throat> Just a quick message, quick, quick message. Um, enforcement action. We are required to take enforcement action. We have a duty to do so. Um, and majority of where we've had those premises where we've had to w enter under warrants. Um, we then deal subsequently with issues. We still work with the landlords even up to this point. But where we fail to get any compliance and we have to protect the standards for the tenants concerned and the courts thus far have seen fit to support us in issuing penalties of approaching two million, I have to say. So it's a very significant sum in penalties. I won't say that they're being paid, uh, but those are nonetheless standard penalties that have been issued under the legislation to rogue landlords, rogue letting agents, and, uh, and those who are failing to raise their standards for their tenants. A bit on licensing. Again, the similar sort of pattern as you see, as we saw in relation to the um, enforcement activity. Um, I've got two, two officers with me tonight. Shamal Mashruk, she's, um, she's the one responsible for the uh, enforcement activity in the, in the main, and then the licensing approvals. I've got Cheryl Hart with us tonight. She can answer questions in relation to the numbers of licenses, types of licenses um, and the process concerned. Um, the, you see the bottom lines there, the blue and the red lines. Uh, <clears throat> the minority of, of our applications are houses in multiple occupation. Those are the HMOs and the majority of approvals, as you see, the green line, those are the selective licenses. Those are the single, uh, single tenant properties uh, that we license. Again, a dip because of COVID. Um, and again, business as usual now, approximately 500 license applications a month get processed. We have a backlog. If you're a, if you're a landlord and you've made an application and you haven't received yet, by all means, get in touch. Ask us where it is, but we do we, ha we do have a backlog and we we are programming the whole of the licensing processing over a five year period. So you want to know where you're at, please, by all means, do get in touch. Um, details are on the council's website on how to do that. <clears throat> now in the future, um, I'll go through these quite quickly, uh, Richard, because I know we're tight on time. Um, during the period of the COVID-19 um, pandemic, we have redeployed some of our team to Rebridge's wellbeing team, um, paid for by government in order to support vulnerable residents, deliver food parcels, we're making phone calls to vulnerable residents, just making sure on a regular basis that those that are in need are receiving support from the council. So that was a, in a very important piece of work that we did um, in relation to all, all residents in the borough, um, but particularly those in the rented sector. We gave uh, landlords a three month payment holiday. We, we appreciated there were some difficulties um, in relation to the pandemic. I won't go into them. You know what they are. I know what they are. Um, so we, we had that payment holiday and that was partly due, uh, an issue as to why uh, we slowed down, had to slow down on the issuing of licences. Um, I mentioned since August 2020, 
Council's in multiple occupation, dealing with those, helping with those, improving the standards in those is our priority. Dealing with the untidy front gardens and the antisocial behaviour um, and where we can, um, eliminating that and raising the standard for those persons living in and around that locality. Uh, we've reissued 300 licenses to Pioneer Point. For those who don't, near Pioneer, don't know Pioneer Point, it's the landmark building um, in the town, in the middle of Ilford Town Centre, and you can see it from all over London. We've increased all our joint working. We do fantastic um, joint working, partnership working with uh, other agencies in the council, with agencies outside the council, and indeed uh, we're here in partners with the with the forum, Richard, and we. Uh, we again, like everybody else, are glad to be here. So increasing joint partnership working, that's where we've been. Where are we going now? Um, we're doing a 10% desktop check of all our selective license holders. That was an objective of the uh, of the scheme when we began it uh, just over two years ago. So that, that is ongoing, but uh, being accelerated uh, as we speak. Um, we're resolving, we, had it, we have a, a piece of software called TIMS, which we have run and it, it gives us intelligence on where there might be unlicensed properties, um, unregulated properties throughout the borough. And um, I'm sure it's not none of yours, um, but, but where the, those have been identified, um, we, are, we are looking to work with the landlords to get those properties properly licensed. Um, we've improved our systems, uh, back office and software to deal with licenses and issuing of licenses. So we've become more efficient. Um, hence the increase that you may have seen there in the numbers of licenses being issued. Um, and we look into the future to develop uh, a new piece of software, uh, a web based software, uh, which will give us and um, landlords and everybody involved access to information and uh, how we're managing to achieve improvements throughout the borough. So a new bit of software on the horizon. Um, might be a bit expensive, but we're, we're, we're doing a cost benefit analysis of whether it's worth going down that particular route and improving the system. Working more with letting agents as well as identifying unlicensed properties ourselves. Um, more follow up joint working between the enforcement agencies. We're working closely at the moment on COVID. Uh, Gladys didn't mention this earlier, but we're working very closely on COVID issues with the police, not necessarily in the private renter sector, but in the commercial sector out there. And one issue to mention as well, London Trading Standards, we're part of the London Trading Standards Network, Trading Standards is under my umbrella. Um, there is a client money protection scheme. Um, all agencies are required to be members of a client money protection scheme. That means protecting your money as a landlord um, if they are collecting your rent for you. So they should have um, a protection scheme in place so that if anything happens adversely with them, your money is always there and protected. OK, so we'll be doing that bit of work to ensure that all of our um, letting agents in the borough uh, meet the correct standards. And that's my my presentation, Richard. Um, as you can see, end of show. Um, please, everybody, post questions if you have any. Um, if you don't want to post them today or we don't have time to post them today, please do look in on the Rebridge website. There's a lot of good information there, on not only for uh, the private rent sector and the work that we're doing here, but for all of our tenants and all of, all of our residents in the borough on what Rebridge is actually doing for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed, for that. And in, in fact, we do have some questions and, uh, for you and your colleagues. So there's one here, first of all, which says that for the electrical test, the council specifies an NIC, EIC electrical test, but or, or certificate, I guess. But there are, of course, other bodies um, with whom electricians are registered. Uh, so there's a query as to why the council specifies that. I don't know if that's somewhere on the licensing application process. Can you Richard, clarify that? Um, is it OK if you can hear me, Shamal's coming in on that one. Thank you, Shamal. Oh, Shamal, hello. Great. Welcome. Great. Um, there's no oh, requirement for well. to be. Yeah, um, it doesn't have to be NICEIC. It has to be an approved body. Um, landlords can get in touch with us with specific properties and uh, specific queries, and we will be able to work through with them. Um, but it can be an approved body, i.e. NAP it. Um, but they need to get in touch with us and with the enforcement office, and we will work through with them. 
Okay, thanks for that. And we've got another question, which is about the backlog in license approvals. Now, Ed, you've explained that there is a bit of a backlog. Somebody says that they've applied approximately a year ago and made their first payment for their selective license, and they've got the confirmation uh, of, of the reference number, but they've not been contacted regarding the license being granted. Of course, once you've made the application, you are compliant, aren't you? So um, they shouldn't worry in That's terms right. of not yes. being able to serve Section 21 notices. But I know landlords sometimes do get anxious because they don't hear anything for a while. No, well, in um, answer to that particular point, Richard, yes, once you've made your application, you are compliant. Um, you, you've got no fear then. Um, we will work with you. Uh, we will review the application. And if we've got any questions, we will come back to you. Uh, in relation to the backlog, Cheryl's eagerly waiting uh, and, uh, to come in and I'll give you the response on that because I know Cheryl right. very well. So I'll leave it over to you, Cheryl. Good evening, everybody. Um, if anybody specifically is worried about any particular application, just email prslicensing at redbridge.gov.uk and we will try and give it priority to get it issued. So if you're if you're really concerned or sometimes people need it because of their mortgage or whatever, just get in touch and we'll try and do our best for you. Um, we, we had about 14,000 selective licences and at the, in the early stages um, we were doing them all manually, they weren't automated. We have had them automated for the last year but we still have got another 4,000 to clear. So we will, we are getting through them quicker now. Um, December 2018 we had the early birds and we had about 5,000 applications come in in one month so it took us a long time to get past December 18. Now we're clearing about two or three months in a month so we should be moving up quicker now. But anybody wants anything, um, any comments, any uh, reassurances that they're okay, just email us at prslicensing at redbridge.gov.uk and I will respond to you personally. Uh, thank you, Cheryl. And we've got another question actually similar to that, which says that they applied for a license over a year ago and still haven't received the license. What's the average wait time for selective license? I suppose that depends on when they applied, doesn't it? Yeah, but it if depends. Somebody applies yeah, it's, now, yeah. how long might they expect to wait? At the moment, it's it's hard to say at the moment. At least it's going to be. It's hard to say because we're, we're, we're trying to get rid of the backlog. But it, all I can say to you is that um, we once you've applied, you're safe. You're not going to get prosecuted or anything. You've made an application um, and, you know, if you want any reassurance of that, you've only got to email us and we will respond to you. Um, we're hoping to get the backlog down as quickly as we can. But as Ed said, at the moment, a lot of the staff are working on the HMOs at the moment as a priority. Why? While we've got this window of opportunity to do visits, because if there's another lockdown, that will all stop again the visits and then obviously the work will we'll go back to doing more desktop checks and things like that. I will come back there um, Richard and just say I mean supporting what Cheryl has said there I mean the bargain basement the early birds um, we had a massive influx of applications at, at that time um, we have now cleared all of those and I would say we're approximately a year, a year behind now so those 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 licensees who have applied around about a year ago I'd imagine that they I could expect they would hear from us reasonably soon. We are accelerating the numbers of licenses that we are dealing with. We've, as I said, we've become more efficient. Um, we're dealing with um, the uh, sort of two or three months at a time we're catching up now. So um, we, we, we're, we're looking to be within about a, a within a year's time completely cleared the whole backlog. Um, it is unfortunately, as I said, the, the, the vast majority of our licensees were compliant and they've all come in at the beginning of the scheme and of course we've got to try and run the scheme over a over five year period so um, we apologize and we uh, we are we do regret that it's it's a year's wait but we can give the assurance that once you've applied you are compliant all you do not have is your little piece of paper oh and the demand from the council for your uh, for your second installment by the way so uh, <laughs> i wouldn't worry too much about it we we have it we've uh, we've accepted it we've given you acknowledgement and, and we'll, we'll be on it as soon as possible. You talked a little bit about enforcement, Ed, but somebody else has said, has asked, is action being taken against those who have failed to license? And um, uh, I can assure people that action is being taken, isn't it? Can you tell us a bit more about that? I, I, I can, um, but I, I, I don't want to steal Shamal's thunder, so I'll let Shamal answer that one because she's the lead on those issues. <laughs> We're taking action um, every day. Um, I manage the proactive, proactive team, which means that we proactively um, search the borough for unlicensed premises. Uh, some of them will come in through uh, complaints, but we also have um, a piece of software 
that um, we uh, sift through. It's a 10 year intelligence model that tells us um, information on unlicensed properties in the borough. We use that and we also use intelligence uh, from residents who report unlicensed premises and um, our officers are very busy, extremely busy targeting those unlicensed properties. And as you can see, the results, the results are there. I mean, uh, Ed talked about uh, fines. It's not just fines um, that we uh, deal with. Uh, criminal landlords are dealt with through the court process as well. We have um, in the last year over 50 prosecutions, substantial prosecutions dealing um, with criminal landlords. So we are enforcing, we are targeting those um, who are um, who are operating illegally in the borough um, and we're very busy. OK, thanks very much, Bob. We had another question about whether uh, it says when the licence first came out, I got in touch to. But I was outside the proposed area. Will I be informed if this changes or do I have to keep checking the site? Well, you might not get informed. I mean, what I would suggest is that you go to London Property Licensing um, dot co dot uk and uh, that's got all the up-to-date information on licensing across london there's also a system on nrla dot uh, dot uk that's the nrla website and if you import the postcodes of your properties that will tell you whether or not they fall within a licensing scheme so that's probably it, one of the best ways for you to keep up to date it's much better for you to actively check whether your properties are within a licensing area rather than just hope that someone's going to automatically email you. So there is certainly an onus on landlords to to try and stay up to date um, themselves. Can um, I just add to that? Can I just add to that, Richard? Yeah, I think sure. what what I think what people don't realise is um, we don't know who who all the landlords are out there. There's not a national register. Every time you rent a property out, you don't sign up and tell everybody, "Here's my name, here's my email address." So, the, the comments I've had in the past is, "Why didn't you tell me that I needed a license?" But unless you've ever come to our attention in, in the past for anything, we wouldn't know who you are anyway. So that's why it's very important to for landlords to check the websites. Um, the London Property Licensing, as you said, is a good source because he, um, Richard Takani, deals with the whole of the London boroughs and keeps it. He's very up to date, so he's a good one-stop shop really to see what's going on throughout the whole of London. But obviously, we don't know. It's like we don't know all the letting agencies either. Some letting agencies change their names overnight. It's very hard to keep up with everybody and keep valid emails all the time. So you Absolutely, know, please check the yes. websites. <laughs> OK, well, thank you very much to all three of you. Um, I'm actually um, going to bring Lackey back in because we've had some questions on waste. So I, I bid you farewell for now. We may have you back in before the end of the of the webinar. Thank Good you night. very much. Thank um, you. Uh, Lackey, hello, welcome back. Um, we've had a couple of questions. We get these complaints in Hackney as well, where I live, actually, about um, the service, the customer service provided by some of the waste operatives. So my tenants remove their rubbish from their bins, says this questioner, as as bins go missing by the time they come home or with with bad weather, they get damaged, etc. The bin men don't necessarily place the bins back securely. Um, and also they said that the order of recycling bins can take months. My neighbour ordered a bin back in May and she's still waiting. There's another question on similar lines. Uh, this is an ongoing issue. When they empty our normal waste bins or recycling, they just leave the lid off and dump it back to the drive in a very untidy way. Is it something the council can sort out by providing more training to waste collectors? Thanks in advance. So there's no doubt it's a tough job uh, being one of those um, operatives. It, um, and they're often in a rush. We often see them rushing down the street. But um, residents often really appreciate things being done a with a little bit more care, don't they? Totally. Um, so we can, if there's a specific area or if there's a specific location where this is happening, then we can look into it and speak to the collection team. Usually they are quite good at returning the bins back to the boundary. Um, sometimes they do leave the bin lids open, which I can only apologise for. But generally they are quite good. Like I said, I live in the borough. If there is a specific area that you have a problem with, <clears throat> by all means, if you email the Our Neighbourhoods team inbox, we will look into it for you personally. Okay. 
With regards to the recycling boxes, the recycling boxes can be collected from um, the council's offices based at Lay Street. It comes under Redbridge Transport or they call it the REN. The collection times I'm not sure of at the moment, but there is a good stock of recycling boxes and they are freely available. Um, so you just need to fill in the online booking form and then you need your council tax statement and collection is as simple as that really. If there is a delay, it might have been because of COVID and they had to change the collection um, procedure because at one point you could collect from Linton House and other locations in the borough and obviously we've had to reduce that to just one location and just control the collection process a bit. Okay. And okay, thanks very much for that, Lucky. And another question now, which is about keeping front gardens tidy. This is quite interesting. Um, the question says, thankfully, my tenant is very good with this, but I have seen others are not so good. Mm -hmm. Who is responsible for keeping the front garden tidy, the landlord or the tenant, the tenant being the occupant of the home, of mm -hmm. course. And if enforcement action was taken, would they approach the tenant or the landlord? Right. So in the first instance, we would speak to the tenant because obviously they're living there and if the garden is untidy, an enforcement officer or one of me and my colleagues will knock and say, have you had a look at the front garden and what are you planning to do and do you think this is suitable? Often people don't mean to or there's been, maybe they're waiting for a bulky waste collection or they've had a party or, you know, lots of reasons. But we can try and mitigate that by looking into why the garden is untidy in the first place. If there is no um, valid reason, then obviously they can be issued with what we call a fixed penalty notice just for littering in the first place. If it moves on to an enforcement action with regards to an untidy front garden, it gets a bit complicated. Um, it can be to the freeholder of the property, so it can be the landlord. Um, it depends on each individual case by case and how it's been presented and what also is being presented and the clearance costs as well. Um, often, like I said, once enforcement are involved, the gardens get tidied up. Sometimes people need a um, gentle reminder um, and often we don't want to escalate it as much as residents and landlords definitely don't want to escalate it, but it would Probably, if it ended up in court, it would be the freeholder of the property or the, and land, I do need the landowner. I need to stress the importance of landlords doing regular inspections of properties. Inspection, I mean, yes. Sometimes when I'm in an area, I will just drive past, I might take a slight detour, drive past the property, um, sometimes even just jump out of the car, just check that the outside of the property looks OK, check yes. what the front garden looks like. Okay. And, you know, you should be doing that regularly um, uh, just to keep an eye on things. And of course, if tenants are dumping rubbish out the front, that could be an indicator that there are other problems going on in the property. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're sub letting or you know something's going on uh, that is otherwise untoward so um mm. yes the other thing is, um, richard we often hear especially with tenants who live um flats above shops they're not always clear on their collection flats above shops are often on a daily collection service um again some are not depending on how the coll collection team can um, enter the property premises or the particular road. So again, it's up to the landlord. If you're not sure, then contact us and then we can give you specific advice for that particular property. Um, as a landlord, once you confirm to your tenant how they should present, where they should present, it makes the matter a lot easier to deal with in terms of, is it your tenant not complying or is it that they just genuinely don't know? Um, this is this, isn't often, it? With the landlords, I've got properties above commercial and it's up to the landlord to find out when the waste collection is and inform the tenant when they move in. So, or make sure the agent does, um, mm. because that then minimises problems, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes. And we often okay. write to tenants. Okay. Great. Sorry, Lucky. Yeah, I'm just conscious yeah. of time and um, we, we're running a little bit over, but thank you very much. It's very helpful. And thanks thank to everybody for your questions as well. Now, I'm reliably informed that we can hear from Paul Campbell now, uh, Managing Director of Green Vision Energy Limited, uh, who's going to talk to us about Green Homes Grants. Now, um, are you there, Paul? Come in. Can you hear me? I'm close. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, hooray. Welcome, Paul. Um, it's Thank great you. to hear from you. Now, we're running a little bit late, Paul, so both you and I with our presentations are going to have to kind of go uh, pretty swiftly. Oh, I hope that's OK. Absolutely no problem. I'll be super quick and apologies uh, for my IT issues that I've had tonight. 
Um, I believe, uh, if you could let me know when my PowerPoint's on the screen, and I believe when I say next slide, somebody's going to move it on to the next slide. That's absolutely right, yes, and we can see it now. So all's going well so far, Paul. Thank you. Over to Thank you. OK, um, uh, yes, again, apologies once again, guys. I'm Paul from Green Vision Energy, Managing Director. Just going to talk to you about the Green Home Grant. So the first slide, if you can move it on to the next slide, please. Uh, if you could just let me know when the next slide's moved on, just so I know we're both looking at the same screen. Yep, we're on the next slide. OK, so uh, the agenda, very simple, just who we are. Um, what products and services we offer, but the most important thing, a bit of information about the Green Home Grant and then any questions that you guys may have. So Green Vision, um, we're specialists in electric heating. We've been going about eight years now. We also look at other measures such as loft and cavity wall insulation as well, but we're passionate about helping people save energy. Uh, we've worked with a lot of landlords and we've done a lot of presentations at the Landlords Forum. And we're happy to give free unbiased advice so if people do have questions or if they just want some general advice come and talk to us we have all the usual accreditations such as chas construction line etc and we also install for the likes of ovo energy and edf and the reason they guys come to us is because of our professionalism and our expertise next slide okay so next slide up yep Oh, I think there's a bit of a delay. Uh, yeah, so these are just some of the current people that we work with as a combination of landlords and social housing providers. Uh, next slide. Yep. OK, so just our products and services. We do electric heating. Um, if anyone's got any challenges around electrically heated properties with old storage heaters, mainly to improve EPCs, we install high heat retention storage heaters. And we also do loft and cavity wall um, insulation as well. Uh, we also do solar um, and cylinders. Uh, we also get involved with EPC modelling. So again, if anyone's got challenges around low EPCs and they're looking to increase them, we'll come and do an initial EPC, recommend the best measures to, to increase uh, the EPC rating and work with landlords and we offer a one-stop shop. Next slide. Yep. So, so how does the grant actually work? Um, essentially, it, it's a scheme that's been designed by the government to help homeowners reduce their energy bills. And you can have measures such as double glazing, loft insulation, air source heat pumps, etc. Um, it's a voucher. Um, one of the things you need to be aware of, it's only available until the 31st of March. So if you do want to, if you are thinking about doing this, you need to crack on and get things uh, moving. Um, the government recommend that you get free quotes. Um, you don't have to, you can get away with one, but that's their recommendation. And the good news is if you do have any other funding pots or if you want to tap into any funding pots, you can also claim things like eco funding as long as it's uh, for a different measure. Next slide. Yeah. So um, how much are the, the vouchers worth? Um, 5,000 pounds. So it's not too, too bad. You know, the value is not good and it's available for landlords and what I class as able to pay customers. So essentially they will pay up to two thirds of the cost of the measures that you're looking to install. And if you're on benefits, um, you can get up to £10,000 and it's 100% um, fully funded. Next slide. Yeah. Now, the way the scheme actually works, you have to have what's called a primary measure so that's things like solid wall insulation, cavity wall insulation, et cetera. So these are the more chunkier measures. Um, and then you've got your secondary measures such as double glazing, um, hot water tanks, um, et cetera. Now, I don't like the way the government's done this because what they should have done really to make the scheme easier and more accessible to people is just basically offered you any of these measures. But essentially you have to have a primary measure first and then if you want to take advantage of any of the other measures like double glazing, that would be a secondary measure. So uh, the example I've put below there, um, if you were spending say a thousand pounds on a primary measure, you could then spend the thousand pounds on a secondary measure. So it's not, uh, but the reason I don't like it, a lot of people and a lot of you guys would have probably done your loss, um, cavity wall insulation, et cetera. 
but there are things like flat roof installation and room and roof which are there and uh, s or c pumps as well so just be mindful of that because a lot of people are sort of getting excited thinking we can have double glazing um you can't because well you can but you need to have a primary measure uh, for that's it. exactly what i found paul actually that you know a lot of i obviously i speak to a lot of landlords through my nrla work and indeed myself you know we're hoping to do double glazing and so on but we're a bit frustrated to see that we have to do these primary measures first and oh. that um you know a lot of the uh, and also the second the work you do on the secondary measure is capped at the amount you spend on the primary measure is that right absolutely correct yeah and it, it, it's a real, real shame because um, we've had loads of inquiries, people wanting to do these secondary measures uh, and not the primary ones. Hopefully um, the government may change it because there is a part of two billion that needs to be spent. And the take up has been quite slow, um, believe it or not. And I think it's because of the way they have structured this. But yeah, sit tight and wait and then there may be some changes uh, going uh, going forward. Next slide. So, yeah. um, how do you apply? It, it's relatively straightforward and painful. Uh, there's a website that you can go to, which I put on the screen, where you can see if you're eligible. Just literally go to that website. It takes a couple of minutes and it will tell you if you are eligible. Step two, you need to find a trade person uh, that's registered um, under the scheme. Now, this might be challenging based on where you are in the country because there is good coverage in certain parts of the country and not so good in other parts. But they do need to be a registered installer. And at the moment, I think there's only 900, which sounds a lot, but it's not a lot when you're talking there's 2 billion that needs spending. So again, just be mindful of that. You may struggle trying to find an installer close to where you are. And then step three, um, apply for the voucher. So you need to make sure that you've got your quotes, when you log on to the website, you need to enter your date of birth. You need to make sure that you've got the Trustmark Tradesman's registration number and then you've got a quote as well. Relatively painless and easy to do um, and upload. Once you've done all of that, you'll then be emailed uh, your voucher. Be mindful as well that some tradesmen are charging for surveys as well. Uh, so just be mindful of that because some of the survey prices, depending on the measure you're having, like S or T pumps, can be a couple of hundred quid so just just be mindful of that next slide yep so uh, the last one then is just uh, frequently asked questions um i've mentioned yes you can be charged to get a quote um uh, sorry do i apply for a primary or secondary measure yes you can apply for a primary measure and a secondary measure at the same time or you can apply for a primary measure and then later at a later date, apply for a secondary measure. Um, you can use different installers for whichever measures you are using. Um, some installers may ask for a deposit and it is an online application, so you can't do it by the post or anything like that. Um, and next slide, and that's me uh, me done. As I say, apologies once again for uh, not getting on uh, a little bit earlier, but if anyone's got any questions, feel free to drop me an email, drop me a line um, if you need any more advice. Thank you very much for that, Paul. And um, uh, we don't seem to have any questions at the moment, but if you're able to stay on the line uh, and there may be some at the end, um, uh, but as you say, um, if people sort of think about this overnight and want to contact you, there are your contact details on the screen. Um, so thank you, Paul. I'm sorry we had trouble uh, connecting you early. I know it wasn't your fault. It was just the wonders of technology uh, and the gremlins in the system. <laughs> no, that's OK. Um, yeah. OK, thanks very much then, Paul. Um, well, I'm going to move on now to my presentation. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and hope everything works OK now. Uh, let's have a look. There we go. I'm hoping you can see my uh, presentation now. And um, so I'm going to talk to you about top 10 challenges facing London landlords. And this is a presentation that I update periodically. Um, so uh, obviously I've done an, an October 2020 version. I hope you find this interesting. I'll whiz through them and see what you think. And if you've got any questions, then let me know at the end. So first one is avoiding the courts. So as you know, the courts reopened on the 21st of September 2020. Um, now you need to serve a reaction 
activation notice if you want to take a case through the courts now. Um, uh, so, you know, if you brought a case uh, before the 20, uh, I think it was the 28th of March when the courts closed and you want to continue with that case now, then you'll need to serve a reactivation notice to the com uh, to the, the tenant um, that you're serving it on and also notify the court. You'll also need to um, complete something explaining to the judge uh, what impact COVID has had on the tenant. Now, there's going to be a prioritisation of cases, so cases involving antisocial behaviour, uh, severe arrears, squatters, domestic abuse, fraud, uh, subletting and also abandonment of properties will be prioritised. Uh, both Section 8 and Section 21 procedures now require six months notice, not the usual uh, two months, of course, with Section 21 that we've had uh, pre-COVID. Um, there are exceptions to this. If it's a domestic abuse uh, case or it's to do with the tenant having made a false statement, um, then it's two weeks notice. If it's to do with antisocial behaviour and arrears, it's four weeks. And if it's to do with right to rent, then it's three months. Now, there are special arrangements over Christmas. Um, there'll be no bailiff evictions allowed between the 11th of December and the 11th of January, unless it involves domestic abuse and antisocial behaviour. Uh, but the important point here is to expect something like a 12 month process for court action. That's what a lot of experts in this field are saying. Um, there's restricted use of some court venues at the moment because of social distancing. And also there's a backlog of old cases and of course an increase in new cases. I mean, Shelter has argued that there'll be a considerable number of people falling into arrears. Um, as a landlord association, we've argued that you know a lot of landlords will be working with tenants um, to resolve that rather than taking them through the court procedure. And there is this pre-action plan for rent disputes that we've agreed with the Ministry of Housing. So what we're asking landlords to do is to um, uh, consider these nine golden rules before they go to court or attempt to go to court. This is voluntary, um, but uh, here they are. Let me run through it quickly. First of all, communicate with the tenant, of course. I know that can be difficult sometimes because sometimes tenants just put the phone down and don't want to speak to you, but try your best. Establish whether the tenant is vulnerable. Um, signpost them to organisations who can support and advise them. So, for example, CAB or the Shelter Helpline. Agree an affordable repayment plan where possible. Be clear with them by providing quarterly rent statements um, and showing any changes. Um, try and get consent from the tenant for direct payments of the ho housing um, element of universal credit or any other benefits. Do involve guarantors in discussions and arrange mediation if you can't agree, if that's possible. And of course, re record all contact with the tenant. Now, all this information is available on the NRLA website, so do have a look at that if you think it will be useful. Challenge number two, hone your people management skills. So, you know, following on from that, it's so important that you stay in touch with your tenant during these difficult times. And, you know, it's important to know when to phone or possibly meet up with them. Um, I've had a few tenants um, have situations where one of the sharers has moved out because of difficulties have ar arisen either during the lockdown or after the lockdown because one of them wants to move back with parents or wants to go back to their country of origin, etc. And, you know, very often tenants have asked me to, to meet with them in person because they just want to talk through it and they're anxious and, and they want to know how it's going to work. Obviously, we're social distancing when we're doing that and, and taking um, COVID secure measures. It's important to ask open questions. You know, sometimes when you ask a question and leave a space, you find out all kinds of things from the tenant that you wouldn't have otherwise heard. And obviously listing skills are important. Do manage arrears clearly and firmly though. You know, I always say that once the tenant is 10 days in arrears, then that is serious because, you know, very soon in 20 days or so, they're going to need to pay next month's rent. And that means they're, they're very quickly going to start to build up a big debt. So do contact them ASAP and, um, you know, signal the seriousness of the situation. You know, if you get in touch with them three or four days after rent was due and you discover that, you know, they're unable to pay, then you can quickly get them to make a universal credit application, which could help. So, you know, it's important to, to move quickly. Agree clear objectives. And I always think it's important to set a clear date by which you're going to review things and then contact them, uh, you know, as you say you're going to, and as I say, assist with benefits.
Now, COVID safe procedures, as I just mentioned, well, these apply for viewings and uh, maintenance visits, which I'm sure many of you have been doing. I certainly have been. Um, so wearing masks, sometimes gloves and two meter social distancing is important. Sometimes tenants have said they don't mind if I don't wear a mask, but you know, if you want to wear a mask, do. And that's obviously for negotiation between you and them. If you are two meters apart and if windows are open in the property, etc., then, you know, just making sure you're doing that distancing is the bare minimum but the government guidelines do say you should be wearing masks you can do virtual viewings of course and that became quite fashionable during the lockdown in fact a lot of people i rented one of my properties with virtual viewings so they can be quite useful and it is just supposed to be one household if you're conducting viewings so you plus one household and bear in mind the six people rule so there shouldn't be more than six people uh, meeting at, at the household uh, at the property uh, tenants can wait outside or in one room if you've got somebody doing a visit for a repair or an inspection. Um, you should be cleaning or avoiding touching door handles or surfaces. Be sensitive to any vulnerability. I've got an electrical um, engineer who's been doing all of my electrical safety checks. He's in his 60s and he's got a respiratory um, uh, health issue. So I do warn my tenants he will be wearing a mask and that he would prefer if, if they maintain a distance or stay in another room. And that they, by and large, have been absolutely fine with that. If somebody is self-isolating, then they should stay in one room um, or wait until you know they've finished their isolation period before you visit. And if uh, you can't do a gas or electrical safety visit because somebody is self-isolating, then just record that, send them an email to confirm it, uh, just so that you've got that, that kind of stuff in writing. And also, we are asking that people are flexible around start or move in dates. Um, a friend of my niece actually was due to move into a property last week, but she developed co um, COVID and she's obviously had to wait until she stopped having symptoms before she could move. And the landlord did kindly adjust the move in date accordingly by I think by three days. Now the fourth challenge is that COVID is on the rise. Now this map is actually from last week. Uh, um, uh, cases in London have doubled in the last seven days. It does show Redbridge, as you can see there, which is one of the darker areas. Redbridge has 94 per 100,000 cases at the moment. Um, and 100 is seen as a threshold for possible increased restrictions. So there is talk that possibly in London, we may see a ban on the mixing of households. I hope that doesn't come in because it will have detrimental effect on the economy. And also it's particularly harsh on people who live on their own. But, you know, we do need to be prepared for this. Um, and that will, of course, affect tenants, especially if they're in affected sectors. Hospitality, as we know, is very badly affected. And, um, you know, the 10 o'clock curfew means that there's less work in hospitality. So we're seeing more people being made redundant in those sectors. There is the government's job support scheme, which begins from the 1st of November, which pays up to 77 percent of somebody's salary as long as they work up to a third of their hours. And self-employed help will continue from the 1st of November, where people will get up to 20% of their average earnings until the 30th of April. Sorry, that should say 2021. But universal credit is being reduced by another £1,000 from April 2021. It was increased temporarily, but it's going back down again. There is going to be help for those of us who have tax or VAT bills coming up next year. We can spread the payment over 12 months. So if you get your tax bill on the 31st of January, you will have 12 months to pay that now. And also, if you've taken out a bounce back loan, and I'll explain more about these later, um, the time period has been extended to 10 years to pay that back. Challenge number five is the looming recession. There's no doubt that, you know, we are in a recession and there is an, a, an a recession happening and about to happen. Um, so sectors that are benefiting, of course, are tech sectors and supermarkets. As we know, they've been very busy because we're all eating at home rather than going out. Sectors that are suffering, this won't be news to you, hospitality, leisure, arts and travel, uh, amongst others. Um, now, there are various cliff edges coming up that we all need to be aware of. The 31st of October is when the main furlough scheme ends and there's a concern that a lot of people will get made redundant then. Also, the EU transition period ends on the 31st of December. So on some levels, we, you know, we were brexiting again. And if we don't have an agreement with the EU, then that could have an impact on the economy. And it's certainly making uh, lots of sectors of the economy nervous. The stamp duty holiday where you pay no stamp duty up to five 
100,000 also ends on the 31st of March. Remember, if you have more than one property, then you do still pay the 3% additional stamp duty. So these are all cliff edges that we're going to fall off and will have an impact on the economy. Unemployment's 4.1% at the moment, but this is expected to rise. The best scenario is expected to peak at 9.2% and go back down to pre-COVID levels by 2022. Uh, the worst scenario is expected to peak at 13.7 next year and be, be back down to 6.3 by 2024. These are uh, um, Office of Budget Responsibility figures. What that means is, you know, more people are going to be unemployed. So there are going to be more people on benefits, more people strapped for cash. And this could well have an impact on our businesses, of course. And we may be more open to taking tenants on, on benefits or, uh, you know, on benefits, part benefits, part time work. GDP, of course, fell by 20 percent or thereabouts in quarter two. Um, and, you know, that's extraordinary. And of course, it won't fall by that much in quarter three, but it's a measure of how serious things are. And there's a big question mark over the shape of the recovery, whether it's going to be a V, a U or an L shape. Most people think it's going to be a Nike swoosh. So, you know, uh, it will dip quite a bit, but gradually go back up. So challenge number six is when to buy or when to sell. Well, I think we may well be coming to the end of the housing cycle next year. It will be 13 years since the 2008 crash. And if you think about it, the previous cycle began in 1995. So that was 13 years before that. Of course, prices are buoyant at the moment. They went up 5.2% nationally. That's according to the Halifax figures um, or up 3.4% uh, in the 12 months to June, according to the Office of National Statistics or 4.2% in London. So prices are buoyant. Rents are going up 1.3% to August 2020 in London as well, according to the Office of National Statistics. Um, sales were up 27% in London, according to Zoopla. That was, um, those figures came out at the beginning of September. And Rightmove also said that there was 125% jump in sales that occurred within a week of adverts appearing on the Rightmove website compared to last year. Mortgage approvals in July were also the same as, as last year. So that suggested to us that the market had got buoyant and, and was busy again, as many of us know. It has been a great time to sell, I think, because lots of buyers flooded back into the market. There was that sort of pent up demand that was released. And of course, the stamp duty holiday has helped that. But I think increasingly we're seeing that buyers are starting to get cold feet and just, you know, they're noticing that prices are buoyant and they're wondering whether it's going to be better to buy next year. Now, looking at what's likely to happen to figures next year, CEBR, which is one of the research bodies and commentators, suggested that prices might fall by something like 10.6% next year. Um, and so that's possible. Of course, it's all crystal ball gazing, um, but do be cautious about buying at the moment because who knows what's going to happen next year. Now, quick word on the mortgage market. This is challenge number seven. Um, this has turned quite significantly in the last few weeks. Lenders are increasing their rates to curb demand. I was looking at Coventry's interest only residential rates and their best rate was 1.47 about two weeks ago, and it's now gone up to 1.79%. So that's quite a jump. And what they're doing is really trying to stop take on less business because they don't want to take on a lot of business at a time when the economy might be going downwards. The range of products has been paired right back by some lenders. Really interesting. And also most 90 and 95 percent loan to value products have been withdrawn, making it difficult for first time buyers. There has been a backlog and delays um, if you're remortgaging, particularly around surveys and valuations. If you um, do get a valuation for remortgage, do expect a cautious valuation. Um, you know, some of the automatic models have been sort of downgrading property values a bit as well. There are still good interest rates around for low loan to value mortgages. So the lowest two year fix on buy to let is 1.44% at 65% loan to value with uh, the mortgage works or there's a five year fix at 1.74%. So if you're on a low loan to value, it could be a good time to remortgage. For capital raising, of course, because of stress tests, you're likely to have to go to one of the specialist lenders and go on to a five year fix. If that's all gobbledygook to you and you're not aware of these changes, then do speak to an experienced broker. So you need a broker who's really, uh, really knows their stuff on buy to let um, uh, and, you know, get some advice from them. 
Challenge number eight is managing your cash flow. So, you know, potentially we might be looking at tenant arrears as people get made redundant. Also, unexpected repairs. I've had a lot of unexpected repairs recently and a few roofs have been leaking this weekend. I've spent a lot of money on electrical safety checks. And bear in mind that if you do let a, a property to a new tenant now, you must make sure you've got an electrical safety certificate before that tenant moves in. And indeed, you need to give that to them, um, you know, when they start to view the property. The deadline for all existing tenancies is the 1st of April 2021. And beware that you might be required to change one of the fuse boxes, you know, or I've had to change some spotlights as well that were non-compliant and, you know, that can all add up. So do plan ahead. I always recommend having separate pots of money. So I have a pot of money for repairs that I put uh, £700 into every month. And sometimes I top that up a bit more. I have a separate pot for my tax bill at the end of the year and so on. Um, and bear in mind, you will be able to spread tax and VAT payments next year, as I've already mentioned. It's worth considering a bounce back loan if you haven't already looked into that, if your cash flow has been affected. So you can get up to 25% of your turnover up to a maximum of £50,000. It's interest free for the first year, then you pay 2.5% interest for up to 10 years in total. And the deadline's been extended to the 30th of November. So if you've got a business bank account, do approach um, your business bank, uh, uh, your, you know, whoever you do your business banking with, that will be the most straightforward approach because it can be hard if you don't already have a business banking relationship. So challenge number nine is the complexity of licensing. And all I'm saying here is that 23 London boroughs now have schemes. You need to understand the difference between all those different schemes and also what Article 4 directions are. The London Property Licensing website is a great place to go to to um, look into that. The Lake Halls or the course fire safety regulations are also a good port of call to understand what fire safety regulations you need, particularly in HMOs. It's important to have your team of contractors there, you know, like um, locksmiths and uh, people to do your um, f uh, fire risk assessments, etc. Electricians, good to have a team in place so that, you know, you have a good working relationship with them. And bear in mind, as we've already heard tonight, processing of licenses can take up to two years. Don't be too hard on local authorities. A lot of them are just, well, they are just following the 2004 Housing Act that says that licenses must run in five year blocks. So if you apply and you're only given one for two years and you still pay the same fee, that's because that's what the 2004 Housing Act requires. And a lot of us, a lot of people are saying, why don't I, what do I get for my money? Well, I'm afraid all the Housing Act says that you have to get is a license and, and uh, the enforcement that goes with it. There's, the local authority isn't required to provide you with anything else, I'm afraid. Finally, on possession reform, that's my challenge number 10. Just to remind you that the government did uh, mention the renters reform bill in the, the Queen's speech in December last year, where they are they said they're committed to abolishing Section 21, which is no fault eviction. And there will be lifelong tenancies when this bill eventually becomes an act of parliament. Now, we haven't seen the bill yet. It hasn't appeared yet. And we don't think we're going to see anything until next year. The timescale is unknown. We don't think this is going to come in until 20. 2022 and it will not affect existing tenancy agreements but the key issue will be the redrafting of the grounds in section 8 which will be the only way that we can uh, end tenancies and evict tenants and also we're all desperate for the modernization of the court system so the main challenges for landlords are going to be to make sure you choose your new tenants very carefully make sure you properly reference them and also keep records particularly around repairs and compliance because you know once this new regime comes in in, you may well be required to come up with paperwork that shows that you've done things properly. So just to mention briefly now that uh, you may be interested in listening to the NLA podcast or watch webinars. So do go to the NRLA website, website for webinars and the uh, Google uh, Inside Property or NLA podcast Apple if you want to hear the um, old NLA podcasts. If you're interested in joining the NRLA, you can get £10 discount if you use my discount code there, which is R59. And just to mention, you know, of course, once you join, you can use the advice line and there's the phone number for that. And there are three reps in London who are over here at your service. Remember, we're part time. So if you've got a pressing uh, issue or problem, then it's always better to get in touch with the um, NRLA advice line. 
OK, well, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And um, obviously, I haven't been able to look at questions for a little while, so I'll just see um, what questions we've got. I think what we'll do now, actually, before I take any more questions, is we'll go straight into our final speaker, who is Sam Brough, um, who's going to talk about spotting the signs of brothels and making sure you, you don't become victim um, of, of a brothel. And Sam is the Community Safety Officer from London Borough of Redbridge. My apologies to everyone that we're running on, but I'm very keen to hear what Sam's going, so I hand, uh, what Sam's going to say. So I hand over to you, Sam. Thank you very much, Richard. Very much, Richard. Hopefully, Hopefully you can see my presentation and hear me speaking. Have you got it there? Yes, we have. OK, that's great. Thanks very much. Just so, through, Richard. so you can all hear me, yeah? Sorry. Can you, Sam, just run your show because it's on small screen at the moment. OK, stand by. Forgive me, I'll uh, get this right in a moment. Sorry for the glitch. OK, so uh, yes, I'm Sam Bruff. Good evening uh, from the Redbridge Community Safety Partnership. And I just want to take a few minutes to talk to you about brothels and how you as landlords and how we as the local authority can work together to prevent them from operating in our borough. So the Home Office suggests that there's around 13,000 uh, victims of modern slavery in the UK today. That number includes women involved in prostitution in brothels. Most will live and work in private sector rented accommodation and there's over 12,000 licensed private sector rented properties in Redbridge. You might know that as the result of persistent police and council enforcement against men looking to buy sex on Ilford Lane uh, last year, uh, that there are far fewer women involved in on-street prostitution. So it's inevitable that some of them will now be operating from some of our rental properties. So how can you spot the signs? Well. The signs that might suggest that your property is being used for prostitution. Do the people living there have access to their own passports? Are they able to speak for themselves or is someone else doing the talking? Do they look like they're free to come and go or do they look frightened or withdrawn? Are they living in poor conditions or are the neighbours complaining about noise or rubbish piling up? Are the people there actually the same as the people named on your tenancy agreements? Where criminal activity is going on at your properties, uh, rental payments might be arranged by somebody who doesn't even live there uh, and sometimes you might even be offered uh, the full amount of the tenancy up front. So the fines, you'll all be well aware of the legislation relating to your properties and the potential offences that landlords can fall foul of. Failure to license appropriately and breaches of those licensing can lead to very heavy financial penalties as we've already heard. Uh, but this is by no means intended to point the finger and as Councillor Athwell said in opening, as a council we're very lucky to have so many really responsible landlords in Redbridge. So what can you do as landlords? Well we've already established we're preventing two responsible people so you'll be probably be doing all of this anyway but it might be worth the reminder. Thorough background checks and references help you to be clear about who will be living at your properties and that they have previously good record of renting. Make sure that you know the names of all the individuals that are occupying your properties. Uh, for example, require all of them that are going to be living at the property to be named on the tenancy agreement and also it would be subject to the same background checks. As I mentioned, tenancies linked to criminality might not pose any issues in terms of actually paying the rent and on time, but payment records can sometimes flag when something uh, out of the ordinary is going on. And you can compare whether payments relating to your properties are made by individuals named on the tenancy agreement or someone else. And you might want to know why is someone who isn't living at the property paying the rent and who are they? It's good practice to ensure regular checks of properties being rented out. Um,
We just heard from Richard, visits are possible with COVID safe procedures and hopefully moving forward, it will become an easier option again. Uh, but those inspections will help identify any issues with the number of, and identities of people occupying the property compared to what's on the tenancy agreement and also any issues linked to the property itself, such as being used for prostitution or other offences that might hugely impact on your properties like the cultivation of cannabis. It's also useful to maintain a good relationship with neighbours because they'll quickly identify concerns about the property like a state of disrepair, uh, rubbish and unusual smells. Visits will also indicate whether the occupants are exhibiting any unusual behaviours that might indicate brothel activity. An unusually high number of women uh, living at the address and a numerous lone male callers, especially at night, are the obvious things to look out for. A recent police and council visit to a very tidy three bed semi in a clean and quiet residential street identified more than a suggestion that it was being used as a brothel. So you never really know where they're going to pop up. So we're asking landlords to go uh, to sign up to a pledge and in doing so you'll agree to look out for the signs of prostitution uh, slavery in your properties. Uh, once you've signed up, the council will provide information and updates about brothel closures and more advice on how to spot those signs. You'll find the link to prostitution slavery on the housing page of the Redbridge Council website. So if, so if you do have concerns about activity at any of your properties, firstly, don't challenge the occupants yourselves. If you feel someone is at threat and in immediate danger, call police on 999. Otherwise, if you just have suspicions about what's going on, you can call the police uh, the lo and local authority MAT team or the Modern Slavery Helpline or please do drop me an email and I'll look into it myself. Uh, all the contact details that I've referred to uh, should have been or will be provided to you during this meeting. And, and just a reminder that a false alarm is way better than no alarm at all. Uh, and thanks very much for your time and back to you, Richard. You're muted, Richard. You're muted, Richard. Still can't hear you. Still muted, Richard. Richard, Richard, you're speaking, but we can't hear you. About that. I'm sorry about that, everybody. I forgot to unmute myself, a classic error that everyone makes, certainly. Um, <laughs> I hope you can all hear me now. Um, yes, I was just going to say that we've just had one question. Oh, thank you very much, by the way, Sam, for your presentation. We just had one question here um, asking about um, whether somebody can claim for a COVID support grant or a, um, a bounce back loan. Uh, they're saying that they have a full time job and a couple of properties. So, yes, it doesn't matter what your situation is. If you're running a business, um, you know, as landlords, we are running businesses. It helps if you have a business banking relationship with with one of the banks. Um, if you don't, you might struggle. But if you do have a business account, then it should be fairly straightforward and you don't necessarily need a business account to apply for the bounce back loan. So do do go ahead and, and apply um, or, or at least look into it. OK, well, um, it's time now for our election results, and I believe we may have a slide showing the result. Uh, yes, there we go. All oh, right. So the result is I feel slightly odd as chair <laughs> announcing this, given it's to do with me. But there you go. Um, uh, it's been uh, the elections being carried out by um, uh, by our colleagues uh, in, in the background. So the question was, do you elect Richard Blanco as chair of Redbridge Landlord Forum? And 81 percent of you have said yes and 90% uh, have said no. So there's a total number of 26 people voted. So that was the turnout. So thank you very much. It sounds like um, I am re-elected as chair. And for those of you who said no, then, you know, I'm interested to hear if there's something I'm doing that uh, you don't like or something I'd like to do differently. So um, do let us know in, in the feedback form. So you will get a feedback form or feedback survey emailed to you after today's webinar. 
that should go out tomorrow, I believe. Um, so uh, I'm keen to hear any feedback on how I'm chairing the meeting or indeed on the content of the meeting, on, on the um, presentations that other speakers have made. So do let us know what, what you think. It's very likely that our next meeting will also be via webinar. Um, so we will probably use the same software platform because that's what's been adopted by uh, Redbridge um, across, across the board. Um, and we're hoping that we will have another meeting in the new year, likely to be in February, but we haven't set a date yet. Um, so without further ado, I think that's everything. I don't know if any of my colleagues have any other business that they'd like to bring up. Um, and I'll just leave a few seconds silence to see if there's anything else, any other business from anybody. Just one nice and Richard, if I may, if you yes, can hear me. Of course, yeah, yeah, it's been a good forum. We've had some um, positive comments and feedback from individuals in the live Q&A and chat. Um, but I would say you've already mentioned this. It would not have been possible without the organisation and the uh, and the hard efforts of, of Misha um, and the technical team sitting behind us. So I'd like to record my thanks to Misha uh, for a job well done. And indeed for you, sir, for your excellent sharing of the meeting <laughs> under difficult circumstances. Uh, you've entertained us, you've amused us, you've kept us going. We're running a little bit late, but we'll forgive you for that. But um, thank you, everybody. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Yes, I'm sorry it overran. I mean, we were missing one speaker, and uh, we shouldn't have overran. But there were. I really wanted to get your questions in, and uh, and um, uh, the licensing slot took a bit longer than expected. I think, and indeed, I think my talk overran a little bit. So apologies for that. But I hope you found this useful. Thank you very much indeed for joining us this evening. And I echo what Ed, Ed says there. Thank you so much for everybody who took part and uh, for those of you who organised the meeting. And until we meet again, um, we'll have a very good evening and uh, wishing you all the best. Thanks very much and good evening.